The words, the work of the Gideons is to partner with churches in our area to secure copies of the Word of God and to place it around the world. We place Bibles and Testaments in the hands of, bi of men, women, boys, and girls. And God promised in Isaiah 55, 11, that when the Word of God goes out, it will not return void, but it will do whatever God wants it to accomplish. Ephesians 6, 17 says, as the Apostle Paul wrote believe, to believers in Ephesus, he said that the Word of God is God's sword. I was sharing these uh, small green testaments over at the Elizabethtown Community College a few years ago. I gave one of them to a young man, and he said to me, thank you for this pocket knife. I said, pocket knife? What are you talking about? He said, don't you know Ephesians 6, 17? which says that the Word of God is a sword. He said, this little Bible is not big enough to be a sword, and it fits in my pocket. I call it a pocket knife. Now, a pocket knife can cut you up pretty good, but uh, God's Word is this big Bible, the sword, we place Bibles in hotels and motels. This little testament is the pocket knife we place in the hands of students around the world. People's lives get changed when they read that book. Darlene from Dayton, Ohio, grew up in a home where she was a victim of verbal abuse. As a result, she experienced nightmares each night when she would try to sleep. Going away to college, she continued to have nightmares. And she began to think about suicide. She said one day on her way to class, a Gideon gave her one of these little green testaments. And Darlene said, I like to read, but I'd never read a Bible. And she said, I began to read that book. And she said, when I went home that night, I continued to read that book. And she said, she prayed, God, if you are real, please don't let me have a nightmare tonight. And she said she slept well through the night for the first time in a long time. She said, I continued to pray and read that book, and I gave my life to Jesus. The nightmares disappeared. The thoughts of suicide disappeared. And today, Darlene is a happily married young lady serving in the church. Who are the Gideons? Let me just share that with you briefly. The Gideons International is an association of born-again Christian business and professional men. Since 1899, our purpose has been sharing the gospel with the world. Today we're organized in 199 countries and territories and publish scriptures in 107 different languages. We place these Bibles in hotels and motels, hospitals, nursing homes, lawyers and doctor's offices. We distribute New Testaments to schools and colleges, to prisoners, to police, to foreign medical personnel, as well as men and women in the armed forces. All Gideons are members of local churches. We see ourselves as an extension of your local church, and we work in partnership. Actually, we see ourselves as missionaries. By God's grace and your help, we distributed over 68 million scriptures this past year around the world. And since we began, we have distributed over 2.3 billion scriptures. I want to share with you a few testimonies around the world. The first book of scriptures that I ever owned was a little testament It looked about like this. It's a little bit out of style now. It was given to me when I was in the fifth or sixth grade about 70 years ago, if you can believe that. And men who were Gideons came to my school at Cave City and gave me this testament. 
In the 40s, when I received this testament, in our home, we had one Bible, big Bible that my dad would read from time to time. This little testament the Gideons gave me became my Bible through the rest of high school, and I took it with me to the University of Kentucky. Tech was a young man from Malaysia who grew up in a close-knit Buddhist family. He was taught to pray to Chinese gods and his ancestors. Tech was a good student, well-liked by the teachers and his fellow students. When he was 14 years of age, the Gideons came to his school and gave him a testament. He took it home, put it on a shelf, and it laid there for a couple of years. One day as Tech walked home from school, he was robbed. He began living his life in fear, being troubled and often unable to sleep. One night while tossing in bed, he remembered that testament, and he got it out and began to read it. The scriptures he read were fascinating to him as he read of the one true living God. His friends took him to church, and he accepted Jesus as his Savior. His family was upset. His mother and grandmother objected. A few months passed, and his mother became depressed, and she was leaning toward hurting herself. Tech prayed for her mother, and her mother could tell that Tech prayed for his mother, and his mother could tell that he was different. He convinced her to go to church with him, and she went to church, and she received Jesus. And then... A sister and a father also became believers. And again, that happens when the Word of God is present. A Russian Gideon went into a prison. It was a rectangle prison with cells all around the outsides of it. And there was one little building down in the center of the prison. And they told him that there was a man down there and he was crazy. The Gideon took him a Bible and gave it to him. Several months passed, and the Gideon was riding on a bus one day there in town. And he said, a man got on and came up to him and said, do you remember me? I remember you. You're the guy that gave me that Bible. And this was a crazy man. He said, what happened to you? And the crazy man said, I read that Bible. I was touched by it. I became a believer. And you know, a few months after that, I was so changed. They took me out of that cell. And a few more months passed, and they turned me loose. And now I'm free. Again, the Word of God changed that man. It happens. We want to ask you to help us plant some of these seeds, some of these Bibles and Testaments. If you can, remember the Gideon ministry in prayer. Pray for our work. Pray for a steady flow of scriptures. If God would place it on your heart, we're going to take an offering after a while. We would ask that you give some some to help in this ministry. Every scripture that we give has come from somebody like you. And all the money that we receive goes for the purchase and distribution of scriptures. A Bible like this that you see in a motel costs $5. A little testament like this costs about $1.20. For your convenience, if you want to make out a check, just make it out to the Gideons. If you want to pay by credit card, if you look at that uh, Gideon insert, there's a place in there that you can use to fill out your credit card information. If you're not prepared to give today, there's an envelope as part of that bulletin that has our address on it. You can take that home and send it in later. We'd appreciate any of the ways that you can do it. You can also support the Gideons through the Gideon card program. We left some of those cards here. You can get Gideon cards at most funeral homes when someone passes away. You can give, car, or give Bibles in memory of people who pass away.
give Bibles in recognition of graduations, retirements, or other important events, or of somebody you're just thinking of. When my, when my wife passed away almost four years ago, over 500 Bibles were given in her memory. And I'm sure that her influence is still being felt in our world today through those 500 Bibles that were placed somewhere. If you'd have an interest in being a part of such a ministry as this, uh, let me know before I leave and I'll get you some information. Or Mark Pace, who's a member of your church, he is a Gideon, he can talk to you too. I want to close with one final story. But before I do that, I just want to thank Brother Tim. I want to thank all of you for your support and for your giving to help us and allowing me to even come here. One final story. Dr. Bob was a doctor who was not a happy camper. He was an alcoholic. He had betrayed his wife, committing adultery. And had lots of problems. He was not a Christian, wouldn't go to church. He decided to go to Hilton Head to attend a meeting. And his wife and children asked to go with him. They, he took them. And while he was there, he was in his motel room by himself. And as he sat there in the motel room, he noticed a Bible placed on a stand. And he said, some idiot left a Bible in my room. And he didn't believe in that kind of stuff, but he kept sitting there looking at it. And finally, he picked it up and began to fool with it and think about it. And he remembered when he was a young man a verse that he'd heard. He must have gone to church. He remembered this verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And this began to have an effect on his mind. He sat there handling that Bible and thinking. The Holy Spirit came down, got a hold of him. He got on his knees there by the bed and he prayed. He confessed to God he was a sinner. He asked for forgiveness and he wanted Jesus to be the boss of his life. And a change came over him. Peace came. When his wife returned to the room, she found him crying. And Dr. Bob told her, I've been born again. She said, well, we'll see, because he'd always lied to her. They got back home, and the first Sunday, when they were back home, he wanted to go to church. And the family went to church. And when the invitation was given that day, Dr. Bob stunned his family and the church as he went forward, professing a faith in Jesus and asking to be baptized. The Spirit of God used the Bible to touch him and bring him to him. Many a person is affected by the reading of the Word. Thank you for helping us put this Word around the world. Thank you. Thank you, brother. It's always a privilege to have uh, Brother Cletus with us. Um, his family attends church here, the, the Pace family. And uh, I tell you what, uh, they're good folks. Them Paces, they're all right. But anyhow, we're going to give you an opportunity to give to this ministry. Um, and as the ushers come... I want you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. That was the introduction, by the way. Hebrews 4, 12. And the reason that I love this ministry, and the reason that I believe so much in this ministry, and the reason that we have them every year and give you an opportunity to give, is because I am here because somebody gave me a Bible. It wasn't a Gideon, but it was a person. And I'm going to share about that person here in just a second. Uh, but we're going to pray and bless this offering. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to give so that your word can be distributed throughout the world. In a hundred and some countries and 107 languages, 
billions of Bibles have been passed out. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The first time I met a Gideon, I was in high school. I was, it was my senior year. And it was right before I graduated. And they were giving out orange testaments. Do you all still do the orange ones, Brother Cletus? And uh, they were giving out orange testaments. I wish I still had it. But it got misplaced uh, sometime along the way. But anyhow, Hebrews 4.12, if you'll read that with me. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And that's the thing about the Bible, is the Bible isn't just some dead book, it's living. Because its author is still alive. God is living. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. But anyhow, um, back in the mid-90s, I was a parking valet. And uh, I valet parked several people's cars, and, and one girl listened to Christian music. And uh, I would listen to this Christian music as I was parking the car, and I would find myself lingering in that car longer and longer, listening to the message. And then her mother, now her name was Tola. Now, I've never met another person named Tola in my whole life, but her name was Tola. And it was getting close to Christmas time. And this would have been Christmas of 1994. And uh, she came with this little basket, and it had 12 things in it, 12 little trinkets and candies and different things. And she said, I'm going to give you gifts for the next 12 days. Now, obviously, I only work during weekdays, so it took a little longer than, than uh, normal. But she said, I'm going to give you gifts over the next 12 days. And then on the Last day, I'm going to give you a single gift. So basically, 12 gifts, 11 gifts, 10 gifts, 9 gifts. And they were all nice little things that were enjoyable, most of them edible. And um, on the 12th day, she handed me this big old thick Bible. It was a, 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 new, it was a new international version, and it had commentary, and I'd never seen anything like it. Um, the only Bible that I'd ever owned was in the King James, and I never really got that interested in it. I never really read it. I never really cared much for it. And for those of you that know me, you know that I grew up in circumstances that were not godly. Um, I grew up in circumstances where drugs were normal. Um, in fact, they were so normal that in the first grade, my teacher, his name was Mr. Bass, and we went to the circus for a field trip. And during that field trip, he took me home. Um, he drove me home in his personal vehicle and dropped me off to my parents. And my dad looked at him, and he must have just had that look. And my dad said, hey, do you smoke reefer? Now, who, who asked their kid's first grade teacher that? And then what kid's first grade teacher says, yeah. <laughs> so they go in the house, and they smoke a doobie together. Mr. Bass leaves, and I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my whole life, that my teacher did the same thing that my dad did. And I went to school the next day, and I was so excited that I told my friends that Mr. Bass smoked doobie <laughs> with my dad. Well, word traveled, and two days later, Mr. Bass was fired because he did drugs in front of a student. And... Uh, I had no idea, and I got in so much trouble over ratting Mr. Bass out at home that my dad put a sign up on the refrigerator and it said, whatever you see here, whatever you say here, whatever you do here, make sure that it remains here when you leave here. Um, I had no idea that it was wrong to do those things, and I grew up with that same concept, and as I became a teenager, I began to participate in these things, and, and I began to know it was wrong, but I didn't care. Obviously, I knew it was wrong by society's standards, but I didn't care because it was right in my house, and I grew up in that circumstance, and I lived in that circumstance until February of 1995, because that's when I finally started cracking open that life application Bible that Tola gave me. And I started reading through it. And then I got a little bitty television. You weren't allowed to watch TV at work, so you had to get little bitty ones and hide them under the counter. Um, so I, I guess I got saved by smuggling in part. But I hid that little TV under the counter, and I began to watch people like Joyce Meyer and John Hagee. I, I began to listen to uh, J. Vernon McGee and the Bible Bus, because it was one of those little TVs that had a radio with it too. And I started listening to preachers, and I started reading that Bible. 
And then something started happening inside of me. All of a sudden, the things that didn't bother me before began to convict me. And I started thinking, you know, I don't want to do these things anymore. I don't want to participate in these things anymore. So in February of 1995, um, I was in a place of torment. And I went to my parents' house, and they gave me, of all things, reefer brownies. My mom would be mortified if she knew I was telling this story. Because my mom, you know, is a Christian now, and, and, and she loves Jesus. But my dad was still working on him. And I ate them, and there was something wrong. And it gave me what the hippies used to call a bad trip. And I began to panic. And I was walking Beth home, which is remarkable because I hardly ever did that. I was a terrible person at that time. That's another story for another day. And we get to the house, and she, I think she can pick up that something's wrong. So she's trying to kind of talk me through it and coach me through it. And the only thing I want to do is go home and try to go to sleep. Because that was the only solution I could think of. Is if I can go to sleep, I'll wake up and this will be over. And then I remember she was just trying to calm me down. And I just said, Lord, if you will have her, let me go home. So for the, for the first time in my life, I prayed. Because I read in the Bible that people prayed. I said, Lord, if you will just let her have me go home, I'll never touch marijuana again. And at that moment, she said, well, why don't you just go on home? <laughs> I was like, okay. So I went home, and I went to sleep. And the next day, I took all my pot, my paraphernalia, and all my drugs, and I threw them away. And uh, it was a couple months later before I was delivered from alcohol. But ultimately, because somebody thought enough of me to give me the word of God, it transformed my life. And uh, I'm thankful for that. But I want to read you a few texts out of Psalm chapter 119. It is the longest psalm in the Bible. Psalm 119, 9 through 16 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you, and let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. and the ways of your testimony, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes and I will not forget your word. And then if you go on throughout Psalm 119, in verse 25 it says, My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. The word of God has life. Skip on down to verse 81. It says, My soul longs for your salvation. I have hope. In your word. The Bible brings hope. This is forever in verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. God's word does not change. See, that's the power of it, is it has life in it. It has hope in it, and it never changes. That means it'll always bring hope. That means it'll always have life through every culture, through every circumstance, in every nation, in every time in history. Whether it's in the far future or in the far past, the Word of God has remained the same and it always has been life and hope. And that's what I saw when I began to read it. I saw a way out. I saw a way of escape. I've joked several times that I've quit drugs 490 times. But on the 491st time, I had help. Now, I have no idea how many times I quit, but it was a bunch. Because, see, when I met Beth, she didn't want me on that stuff. So I kept trying to quit because I liked her. And I didn't, I didn't want to turn her loose, but there was this thing that had a hold of me that I couldn't get free from, and that's where the Word of God came in. We had been dating, I guess, for a few years at this point. I don't remember how long. But uh, in Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, Brother, Brother Cletus read this a few minutes ago. It says, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So just like rain is faithful, that when it comes down, it doesn't go back up. It doesn't say, oops, never mind, and then change its mind and go back up into the heavens, leaving your crops dry. Of course, we wonder where the rain is right now. And Father, we proclaim, send the rain in Jesus' name. Amen. He said, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. 
It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So there is no way that you can give someone the word of God if they read it, it doesn't produce some sort of result. Now, some people will attack it violently. They will hate it. They will be angry with you for giving it to them. But it will cause a reaction because God's word is that way. Do you know this book is banned in 97 countries? I bet there is not another book on the planet that's banned in 97 countries. And you know why it's bound, uh, banned in 97 countries? It's because it's powerful. Because it has life. Because it has hope. There is no other book like it in the whole world. It is the most widely distributed and best-selling book in the whole world. It is translated in more languages. It penetrates more cultures. It is more unified in its theme. It took somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 years to write this book. And it was written by multiple different authors. Some were captured in Babylon. Some were before Israel was even a thing. There were people in Greek, in Rome, all over the world, in all different nations, in all different backgrounds, yet it has a unified theme. That's not possible without God's help. You can have this many authors, and they, there was no internet back then. You didn't call somebody on the phone to make sure the story matched. Right? It matches because it's God's word. And it transformed and changed my life. Now, we are doing a challenge every week. It's somewhere around 845. At 845, we're asking you to bring your high school, middle school, and grade school students. And every week, we distribute the word of God to them. It is the gospel of Mark. And we challenge them to take it. We give them two Bibles. Now, for the last couple weeks, we've been giving them Bibles and a couple candy bars. Um, Just as kind of bait to get people to take the book. And praying that they'll open it and read it. And I'm going to challenge you to do the same thing. Now, I'm not going to give you little... Now, if you want the Gospels of Mark, let me know. I'll give you a few. But I guarantee you, most of us have Bibles at home that we could give to somebody. Amen? And if you really want to do it, then join the Gideons. And they'll help and equip you. But that Christmas in 1994 was the most significant day in my life. When Tola gave me a Bible. And for the first time, I read it with eyes ready to see. And I read about a Savior that was born of a virgin and took the stain of human sin upon himself, even though he didn't deserve it. And he lived a perfectly sinless life. And not only that, when he came to announce the kingdom, people who were addicted were set free. People who were sick were made whole. People who were discouraged or hurting were given hope. And I read that and I wanted that for myself. And I remember when this first happened, I was carrying a Bible around. But I was so angry that I still hadn't lost my language. And I was using bad language while carrying a Bible. And it really confused my buddy at work. His name was Larry. We'll go ahead and start the music. And Larry came up to me and said, why in the world are you carrying around a Bible and yet you're cussing like a sailor? And I said, because I'm frustrated. And he said, why are you frustrated? I said, because I've been to several different churches trying to find one that matches this book. And I can't find one. And he said, I know one. I'll meet you there Sunday. So I grabbed my girlfriend at the time. We get on the TARC bus. We didn't even have a car. And we ride to that church. And we have a weird experience to say the least. But the pastor calls us up and invites us to come back again. So we come back the next Sunday and there's a man there that preached the gospel. He preached about Jesus. And how he was the perfect man. And he was also God in the human flesh. And how his blood was capable of washing this sin inside of me away. And transforming my heart and transforming my life. And he said, if you'll come forward and pray with me. 
and that God will transform your heart and he'll give you victory in your life. And Beth and I went forward July 23rd, 1995. And the greatest thing in my life happened to me that day. I felt the living God fill me up and transform me and change me in an instant. Now, there was a journey afterward. Don't get me wrong. I had some things to overcome, but I had help this time. I can't describe you how thankful I am for that woman. I don't know where she is. I don't know if she's still alive. But I know God used her to transform my life. Because I had no concept of God. I had no concept of salvation. I had no understanding of the scripture. I thank God for a daughter that didn't turn the radio off. As I was spending a few moments parking her car and I would hear words of hope enter my life. And I realized Tim, or Scott, they called me at the time, you don't have to lose to this thing. There is help and there is hope. And I don't know where you stand today. Maybe some of you stand in need of Jesus. But I'm telling you, never underestimate the transformative power of handing somebody the Word of God. It's something I do on a regular basis, especially young people. I'm constantly giving young people the Word of God because I believe in it. I believe what it's capable of doing. So Tola, if you happen to stumble upon YouTube and hear this, thank you. Thank you to your daughter. There was nothing of value in me that I saw as usable. But God did. God saw my value when I saw no value in myself. And he sent people in my life to redeem me. And I also want to give a shout out to my Aunt Mary Ann. She used to give me Christian records as a little kid. And I would listen to those Christian records. Of course, I just thought it was good music and I thought it was fun. And I wasn't committed to the idea of it. But there was a song that always stood out and it was on Gaither. They made an album called Just for Kids. And there was a song that said, I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a promise. With a capital P. I can be anything anything God wants me to be. Wow. What a good God. I'm going to ask you to stand. I guess I'm just emotional today. When I realized that God had no reason to do what he did for me except that he wanted to. The Bible says in in, uh, 1 Peter 3, 6, I believe it is, that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the Son of God. And I thank God it wasn't his will for me to perish. And I bet there are some of you, you've got similar stories of people that cared about you. And people that reached out to you and people that made sure you had the word of God. And if you get an opportunity, go back and thank that person. If it's your mom or your dad, go back and go back and thank them. Let them know that you appreciate the fact that they cared enough about you to give you the greatest gift that a person can ever give. And that is the word of God. So we're going to pray today. We're going to we're going to close and there are no activities tonight. But if you need prayer, I would love to pray with you. And we've got some folks that would love to pray with you. But more than anything, when you go home today, dig out that extra Bible. Dig out the Bible that you haven't read or go to Walmart and pick them up. You can get them for just a few dollars. Put it in your purse or in your car and 
just pray and say, God, send somebody my way and give me the urge to hand them this book because that's what changed me. That's what transformed me because somebody cared enough to give me the word of God. So I'm going to ask the ministers to come. And if you need prayer, I'm going to ask you to come. There's no specific call today. I just wanted to share my story. And for those of you that have heard it a hundred times, I apologize. But God is so good. And Brother Cletus, every time you come, I'm reminded of Tola. Every time. I'll never forget that person that gave me the word of God. And somehow God prepared my heart to receive it that day. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we give you glory for all that you're doing in us, through us, to us, for us, around us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Is there anyone that needs prayer today? You need healing in your body or you need God to touch your life? I don't want you to come. And for the rest of us, I want us to make a commitment together. And seriously. Um, Those gospels are designed for teenagers. But if you want a few of them, just ask. We'll give them to you. Um, If nothing else, there are Bibles in the library. Go snag one. But if you'll make a commitment with me to say, Lord, I will give out your word. I just want you to join us. We're going to pray together. And just join us up front here. And like my little orange testament, I, I wish I had my, <laughs> I wish I had my uh, new application Bible, my new life application Bible. I don't know what happened to it. I think maybe I gave it to somebody. But see, we have in this room the opportunity to transform the world through one little book that's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And again, if you need prayer, please see one of our ministers. Hallelujah. Let's just say this together. Father, I receive your word and I recognize that you've given us all a call to evangelize. And as we read your word, and it transforms our life, help us to recognize our call to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. This is just so amazing to be able to do. It's so amazing that God would take a drug addict, an alcoholic, someone that had no value to the world and put me in front of you all to lead this congregation. It's just, it's so special. I never take it for granted and I hope that you don't either. God can use you. Can I ask you a question? What if the person that you hand a little testament or a Bible to is the next me? The next person God is calling out I'm telling you, if somebody told me as a teenager, you're going to be 46 years old preaching in front of a congregation, uh, like, you have lost your mind. I'm going to be smoking a doobie is what I'm going to be doing. That's the power of God. Amen. Extend your right hand forward. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you be blessed in everything that you do. And Lord, help us to be distributors of your word. Help us to be peddlers of the gospel. Lord, help us not to just go throughout our lives living purposely, but help us to recognize that you are God and that you can use us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Is Joseph going to be back next week? Okay, well then come on, young man.
You are officially dismissed if you would like to leave, but I want to pray for this young man that served our country. First of all, I want to say thank you. If we could have some gather around this young man. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for Joseph. Lord, I thank you that right now you are doing a transformative work in his heart and his life. And Lord, all the things that happened, Lord, though they can't be erased, Lord, you are bringing healing. And you are bringing wholeness. And Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you have put it in people's hearts to fulfill Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, it says that those who carry the sword do not do it in vain. And Lord, we thank you that you put people in authority and give them the ability to protect and to serve. And Lord, we honor that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. With that said, my wife is standing out there with a bunch of Gospels of Mark. So if you want to take a few of those with you, please, by all means, we have a ton of them. God bless you. Have a good day. No!